So just go back to that, that Planum 10. That Planum 10 rule applies to trauma patients. That means when the boots hit the ground from when you get there, from when the boots hit the ground to when you are taking off with that patient, it shouldn't be more than 10 minutes for your critical, your critical patients that need to go to the, to the hospital ASAP. Okay. See, most critical decisions, so patient priority or severity, we get that right off the bat, right as you're walking up to the patient. You should be able to identify if this patient is going to be a priority patient or not priority based on, off their presentation. So whether to limit scene time or not, okay, uh, which hospital or transport method is best for your patient. As far as hospital, it depends on what we're talking about. If the patient is affected, has mostly burns throughout their body, but is affecting uh, one or multiple systems, then we're, th this patient needs to go to a hospital that specializes in burn patients, right? Maybe somebody with the hyperbaric chamber if they were in a smoking building. Now, as opposed to that, if it's, just, if it's a straight up just trauma situation where a car got entangled and there's just trauma, they, want, they, they might want to go to a level one trauma center meaning they have everything you need for almost any trauma patient. So that's what it means as far as which hospital, because some hospitals specialize in certain things, um, and that's when that really matters. As far as transport, transport, you go off of your, your patient's priority and how far you think is going to take you to get from, your, from the location of where your, your patient is to the hospital. If it's more than 20 minutes and your patient is very, very critical, you're probably better off getting a helo. Of course, it's all situational, but that's just your textbook stuff right there, okay? All right, so some things that will help you determine if your patient is severe or not. So altered mental status of less than a 14 from that GCS that we talked about last time with the head injury, all right? So if they have a head injury, with the GCS of 14 or less, you can, you can take that criteria off and, and mark them off as a very severe if you want to. Hypotension. Systolic is less than 90 millimeters of mercury, that top number on your blood pressure, which could be signs of shock or, or internal bleeding. So internal bleeding is also known as internal hemorrhage, okay? Abnormally slow respiratory rate. Uh, it could be an indication of head injury um, or and or later stages of shock. Now, if your patient has low respirations because of a head injury, we're gonna go ahead and, and um, think that this patient might be in neurogenic shock because of uh, a head injury, because it's related to that. And with neurogenic shock, what happens with your patient, everything just declines. There is no compensation. So blood pressure starts going down, um, respirations and heart rate start to go down gradually and there is no compensation because the nervous system is what helps you compensate when your patient um needs to um com uh, common compensates of what i'm using but i'm trying to do something else uh whenever your body sort of balance itself out from bleeding or whatever is causing the shock all right so it compensates through the nervous system and your head being the brain Obviously, it would affect that. All right, uh, see, determining severity, anatomic criteria. Uh, so any of these would put your patient at a severe level. So penetrating injuries to the head, neck, torso. And the reason for that is because the head and torso, we, um, the head and torso have your three vital organs being your brain, um, your heart and your lungs. So that's pretty, that's a pretty big deal. Your neck, it, there's a lot going on in your neck. Uh, you have your spine, your carotid arteries, you have your, your great veins in there too. So that's why these are also important. As far as the, uh, extremities proximal to the elbow or knee, um, uh, the only if it's a if it's a penetrating if it's penetrating object, um, it is a big deal. I mean, it's always a big deal. But the only reason why I could think it's um that would put your, your patient at a severe level is because if it's proximal to the elbow or knee, 
that proximal means that it's closer to your to your trunk so to the core of your body than the elbow or knee so whatever's in impelled in your body or your patient's body that object is above your elbow or knee so because of that the vessels are bigger and could cause more bleeding you know if the object was to move around or come out um, and that's more of a what can happen afterwards that's why it's a i can see it being severe all right so chest wall instability so again we've seen that flail chest and we talked about the flail chest uh the paradoxical motion and how that can cause more damage uh within the thoracic cavity so we, we talked about that we see two or more proximal long bone fractures again proximal meaning that it's closer to the core of your body to the middle of your body that's the way i look at it uh, and one more time the reason that this could be severe is because as you get closer to the core the vessels are larger they're bigger therefore if they get lacerated or damaged your patient can bleed out a lot faster as opposed to if it was distal meaning further away from the core going down towards your fingers or your toes that is distal <clears throat> Let's see uh, more criteria so crushed we talked about that a crush injury the gloved hand just means that the, the skin was taken out of your hands you see that a lot in um manufacturing companies when i was in the navy that happened to one guy um uh, because the lines get stuck on like on they'll get stuck on a watch or a ring finger on some machinery or it's like a part of the machinery and it'll just take off whatever it's attached to that and it's always the skin usually and maybe some flesh uh along with that mangled you that's also um if you see it i can see that being common inside um i've never seen anybody mangled but if it were if it were to happen i would imagine it would happen inside like a warehouse or some kind of manufacturing company see or pulse is extremely and just more criteria, amputations, obviously, pelvic fractures. Pelvic fractures, is, it's kind of the same deal as with the neck. There's so much going on in the pelvic region. Um, you can have you have a high risk of infection, bleeding out. There's a long list of things that can go wrong with the pelvic fracture. Um, open or depressed skull fractures. And that's, again, that sensitive brain of yours. We, um, we want to take care of that fast and prevent further injury. And paralysis. Let's see, so special patients and considerations. Any questions so far, guys? At all? No. All right. Let's see, older adults do not efficiently compensate for shock. Children may benefit by transport to a pediatric specialty. So, with children, the thing about children is that um. They compensate really well, and I know I've talked about this, but it's definitely worth talking about, especially in the trauma setting. Patients, um, they can compensate very, very well for whatever's going on in their body. However, when they start crashing, they, cr they, they crash hard, and that's because their bodies are so efficient at keeping them balanced, you know, to whatever it is, whatever it is that's going on in their body, whether they're, they're bleeding out or some kind of other issue that they will compensate up until the point where they just can't go no more and they, they crash pretty hard so you want to keep an eye out for these patients at the same time there are hospitals that specialize in pediatrics like um i think what, what's one of them like ready children's hospital i think it's called but so yeah it's those hospitals uh patients with certain conditions taking anticoagulants or pregnant um these two we're talking about trauma remember so if it's trauma if your patient is taking anticoagulants they can bleed out because they're anti-sticky they affect the the platelets so they can bleed out pregnant um what can happen with these is that the baby inside the mother um can have issues and your patient can bleed out like that so the in some situations what you'll have is that you'll have a placenta that is torn and depending on how badly it's torn you depends on how badly the lady will will bleed out not only that but it, it'll also have really negative uh, consequences for the baby themselves too and again it's all situational it depends on how bad the tear is how long the patient's been there waiting 
uh, a lot of factors play into what, what can actually happen to a patient, obviously. Uh, so managing a multi-system trauma patient. So you practice with the crew, determine rules. So this is something that you'll come across this hopefully here in Fresno too, but I know in San Diego it was, it was common practice that as we're going to a call, we already have an idea of what the call is about, right? So as we're going there, we're, we're already assigning roles. Who's going to do what? Who's going to take vital signs? Who's going to talk to witnesses? Um, who's going to take the, the medical history? So as we get there, so when we get there, we all have roles and we go straight to our roles and we don't look like, we don't look unorganized. We know exactly what we're doing and we look professional and it's better patient care too. So it's better for everybody all the way around to just have roles um, and responsibilities before you even get there. So in route to call, review roles each member of the crew will have. Ensure scene safety. Um, obviously that goes without saying, don't ever get that tunnel vision. Always take a, a global picture of everything, take it all in before you walk into um, the situation. Assailant may still be on the scene. Uh, okay. See, analysis of the call. In a scenario with critical injuries, follow priorities determined by assessment. Obviously, right? So we're going to go ahead and identify and take care of life threats first, um, especially for critical patients that are crashing or can possibly crash. Let's see, show good judgment, postpone taking vital signs. So as part of your, your medical assessment, one thing you should know is that that medical assessment is not something that you're going to be doing for every single medical patient. You are not going to be going through that list for every single patient. Um, and your vital signs is part of your secondary assessment. But sometimes you're so busy with the primary assessment with ABCs and trying to maintain your patient alive that you will never get vital signs because you're too busy trying to keep the patient alive. So that that bullet point right there is, is real, it's a it's really good. It's more realistic of what you know what happens out there. Uh give the hospital staff time to prepare. So that just means call them ahead of time. Give them at least 10 minutes, especially if it's a critical patient. Have somebody call them in. Just to prepare for you. Let them know let them know what's going on with the patient, uh, what the main issue is, and how and just as much information as you can that will help this patient out. General principles of multi-system trauma management. Follow priorities determined by primary assessment. We talked about that. Attend to immediate threats. Okay, we talked about that. Reassess what to treat on scene and what needs definitive care. <clears throat> See, depending on your primary assessment, you may postpone taking vital signs. We talked about that. As you reassess your patient in the vehicle, 